Hi everyone. So the letter of Galatians, which you just uh, read from, was written by the Apostle Paul to a house church that he had, he had recently formed in the province of Galatia, located in what is today kind of that central northern portion of Turkey. On Paul's first missionary journey, he had visited the area. He told the Galatians the good news about Jesus, that Jesus had died and that he rose again, and he was the Lord and he was the Savior. And the Galatians, or at least some of them anyways, received this news. They put their faith in this message, believed it to be true, and then from this determined then that they would become followers of this Jesus that Paul had just been teaching them about. And Paul told them that this faith in Jesus really resulted in three things. Faith in Jesus resulted in their forgiveness of all their sins and holiness, the holiness, his holiness became theirs. Secondly, their faith in Jesus resulted in God's spirit filling them, the presence of God empowering them for life and for godliness. And three, maybe surprisingly, this faith in Jesus also resulted in their inclusion, their participation in this new community that was forming, a community where barriers of race and sex and class were no longer defining or no longer limiting. And in this new Jesus community, everyone then was to be welcomed and everyone was to be equal. But there arose a bit of a problem that led to the writing of this letter. All of these letters of Paul's, they really are, most of them anyways, are, are written on the occasion of some type of a problem. And it seems that a group of teachers who are referred to at other places in the letter as agitators had come to the Galatian believers, these new young believers, when Paul wasn't there. And as Paul says at the beginning of chapter 3, I love this expression, they bewitched them. That's what it says in chapter 3, chapter three verse 1. They bewitched them. They fooled them. And as we read the letter, it seems that they did so by teaching them that faith in Jesus actually wasn't enough. That in order for them to be forgiven and filled with the Spirit and included in this new community, they also needed to keep the old Jewish religious law book. And especially, <clears throat> they needed <laughs> to be circumcised. And so Paul, hearing this, writes this letter. And beginning in chapter 3 especially, he strongly urges that this new teaching is, is wrong, dead wrong. And in chapter 3 then, he really begins to lay on his reasoning quite thick. He tells them in the beginning, just before what you just read, that the old Jewish law ended up like a curse. Actually, that is included in what you're, what you're reading today. It, it sets out the rules for how a person and a community could be made holy and right before God, but the problem was no one could ever do it. No one could actually ever live out the demands of the law. And so they ended up, as Paul says in verse 23, locked up to this law, like under its custody is the language it, he uses. Always being reminded that really they were just kind of falling short of God's law and God's intention. And if it served a purpose, that was it. Paul talks about this in other places that it made clear to us that, you know, the law did anyway, that we, we could never really kind of meet up to the standards of God. And so as he argues in chapter 3 then, why would they want to go back to those old laws that they could never fulfill in the first place? And so then in, in verse 24, what you read, having made this case about what the agitators have been teaching, he takes them back to the truth that they first believed when he came to teach them. He reminds them that they have been justified, that's the word that he uses in the section we read, by their faith in Jesus. Now I explain that, justified is a word that means right, or made right, or made right before God. And his point, Paul's point, is that we are made right before God not because of the law or not because of religious rule keeping, but just simply because of faith in Jesus and his grace and his mercy to us. Now, if you're new or just maybe even a child or someone new to this and you've never heard this before, I want you to really listen carefully because what I'm teaching here sits really at the center of the Christian belief. Christians believe that in the death of Jesus on the cross, Scripture teaches that Jesus, who was without sin, 
the only one actually that really did fulfill the law, he received in himself all of the sin and the darkness and the evil and ultimately, as we see at the cross, the death of the world. And this evil and sin then ends up putting him to death. But three days later, he rises again and in so doing, he becomes victorious over all of that evil, triumph over even death. And so what Paul is saying to the Galatians here and us by extension is that their and our response to this is just actually one of faith and belief. And in this act of faith and belief, then what happens is the goodness and the righteousness and the beauty and the overcoming power of Jesus is like poured out on us. We get it. We get that. And actually, Paul says in verse 27, what you just read, that through this faith, we are clothed in Christ. You, you get that imagery, right? That through our faith, what happens is we end up putting on Christ. Now, his righteousness and his holiness, it becomes our own. We, we dress up in him. It's like the great transaction of God. We, we get him in his holiness. And as Paul adds then in verse 26, not, not only are we clothed in him, but then we also end up being called children of God, adopted by God. So in Christ, Paul says, you are all children of God through faith, through faith. The Jesus way then is first and above all built on faith that Jesus did for us what we could not do on our own by religious rule keeping. We're not made right with God by laws and codes. And especially for those of you that are, are new, if this isn't clear then, the first step then on the Jesus way is actually the step of faith. Faith that Jesus is the Lord, faith that Jesus died, faith that Jesus rose again. Even if that faith is just a tiny little mustard seed, Jesus says. And in this faith, this amazing transaction happens. You are forgiven. You are clothed in, in, in Christ. You are called children of God. And as Paul says elsewhere, then you are filled actually with the Spirit of God. Well, next, as we move on then a little bit further into the passage in verse 27, Paul links then this faith to our baptism. He talks about faith and being baptism and connected. So, so he asks, well, what is baptism? Well, baptism then is just this outward sign of this inward faith. When we get baptized, what's happening there is that in a very physical and tangible way, we're identifying with that death and resurrection of Jesus that we've acknowledged our belief in. Like when we go down underneath the water, we are symbolically saying that we have died with Jesus in his death. And, and when we come up out of the water, we're saying we, we, we are rising again with Jesus into his new life. You see how that works? And so the, the first thing, if the first thing in the Jesus way is faith, the second thing is then to be baptized, especially if you haven't already. You have faith in Jesus in your inner person. And you acknowledge that faith then in your baptism, right? And finally then, in verse 28, Paul talks about the implications of all of this. He says that then there is no longer Jew or Greek or male or female or slave or free. And he's reminding them that in Jesus, all of these dividing walls are now gone. That, that in Jesus, our common faith in him and our common experience of his spirit has made us all equal. There's not the law keepers, as they were saying, and non-law keepers. There's not Jews or Gentiles. There's not male or female. No. Because of faith, we're all equal children of God. So the first outworking of God's good news is that these old walls of hostility and the culture that were segregating and separating people no longer apply. We are one in Christ because of Christ all children of the same God, all heirs of him. So there you go. <laughs> That's what we call the good news. It's, it's not about religious code keeping. It's something just so much more wonderful and beautiful. It's, 
It's about faith in Jesus and the mercy and kindness of Jesus. It's about expressing this faith in baptism and then living this out in a community where the walls of segregation no longer apply, where we are all recipients of grace. And if you've never declared your faith in Jesus, I'll just encourage you, today is the day. It happens in your heart. It happens in your mind. And as I say, it can just be a tiny little faith, but today is that day. And if you've never been baptized, then maybe today is also that day. I mean, what's stopping you? <laughs> just go and get baptized. Gather your house, church. Go down to the water. Get baptized. I'd love to hear about it. Get baptized. All right. Over to you. I'd love to hear what else emerges in your discussion as you all talk about this amazing passage from Galatians chapter 3. I, I hope I've been helpful in making sense of it for you. The Lord bless you and keep you.